Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ryan, uh, who has previously worked as a chief scientist at the Descartes Labs and a cosmologist, which just sounds very cool, at the University of Chicago and Stanford University, and who is now a staff data scientist at Cobalt Metals, where he uses his background in physics and data science to, to search for new deposits of battery metals. So without further ado, I'll let Ryan take it away. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for for having me today. Um, I'm I'm Ryan. I'm uh, joining you today from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, in the southwest part of the United States. If you've ever been out this way, and yeah, it's a it's a pleasure to just join and, and share some uh, of the work that I did on forecasting global weather with Graph Neural Networks. Uh, this is work that I did. Uh, I was really in the middle of it about two years ago. So it's um, it, it was work that I did actually kind of in a sabbatical time for me in between two jobs. So I, I just sort of voluntarily wanted to take some time off. And this is a project that I'd had kind of, you know, kicking around uh, in the back of my mind for a while and finally had the time and space to get into it. And um, it was really fun. So this is work that I kind of did just solo um, outside outside any kind of institution or organization, um, but it was it was a really fun project, and there's been a ton of follow up work kind of related to this that I'll talk about too. Um, yeah, so let me get into it. <clears throat> yeah, just really quickly, my background. I know you just got this, but it's <clears throat> it's kind of an atypical background. So. I, was, I trained in kind of physics and cosmology, uh, worked for about 10 years on this telescope in the top right. This is called the South Pole Telescope. It's in Antarctica. Uh, then I've been in industry <clears throat> since then for about seven years. And if I had to summarize it, yeah, it's been a couple of kind of science heavy startups. Uh, Descartes Labs, I was I was there for, for a few years and that's kind of where I was most exposed to Kind of earth observation data so that's kind of the, the the dotted line to numerical weather prediction that's a place where we were using all kinds of remote sensing data satellite imagery earth observation uh, even some kind of weather data and that kind of <clears throat> got me thinking about weather and really interested in this in this question of could we use deep learning um, for weather which i was definitely not the first person to, to think of uh, but it just kind of that that's where this kind of got going for me and then, yeah, most recently I've been, I, I am at this company, Cobalt Metals. Uh, we're trying to find new deposits of the critical metals that we need for batteries to kind of accelerate the, the energy transition and broader electrification. So I do not have a background in, you know, numerical weather prediction uh, or any kind of like actual earth science or atmospheric science, but I've kind of been in this world of, of kind of physical sensors, working with sensor data and machine learning and trying to, to make sense of that data for, for a while. OK, uh, I wanted to start with just a quick look at the main result. So what I'm going to show you here is, a, is a, a video animation, and it's going to be showing you kind of ground truth weather that we've recorded with actual sensors on the left, and then the predictions of the machine learning model that was developed in this project on the right. And the machine learning model is, is being run in a forecast sense where you get a single time snapshot and then it's trying to predict out five days into the future whereas the the sort of ground truth is this reanalysis data set um, era five which is uh which is essentially sensor data inside of a physical model i'll talk more about that but here it is uh so it's going to kind of roll by and no need to focus on you know individual colors or frames here but each one of these is a different kind of weather variable. It might be temperature, might be wind, might be humidity. And each one of these little loops is a five day loop. So it's you know being shown very quickly. And the kind of just headline is that there, this machine learning model has been able to uh, kind of at the qualitative level, give you the same dynamics that we see in the atmosphere. And it's modeling all of those variables, uh, you know, temperature, weather, wind, uh, at the same time on a number of different kind of pressure or geopotential levels. <clears throat> so 
So that's the main result. It's, it's a data-driven system. It's trained on lots of data. It's trained on RFI, which is on the left here. Um, of course, this was a this was a validation sample out of out of training set, but that's the basic idea: is can we can we learn global weather dynamics using a data driven uh, machine learning system? And I'll be showing maybe some other plots like this in the in the rest of this talk. And so these are these are global uh, coordinate systems where it's kind of a latitude longitude coordinate system. So it's the whole Earth sort of rolled out into a rectangle in latitude longitude coordinates. Uh, there's there's a paper, there's a little, you know, uh, website I have for this work, but if you want to kind of dig into it more, uh, bit.ly and then graph underscore weather is a, a place to go to, to learn a bit more. All right, so let me move on. I wanted to start by talking about uh, numerical weather prediction, which is really the, the basis and kind of the inspiration for all of this. Uh, I think numerical weather prediction is this just incredible uh you know scientific and technical achievement and it's actually i, I think quite underappreciated maybe maybe not in this audience but in general i think it's it's really underappreciated how how complex it is how successful it is and how you know hugely beneficial it is for humanity so just a quick sort of lightning overview of nwp uh it stands on three pillars uh, i know you, you might be very familiar with this some of you you might not be but let's go through it First, there's kind of a theory of um, the sort of dynamics of the atmosphere and ocean and land. So these are, you know, kind of partial differential equations that represent certain variables like wind or pressure or temperature, humidity, and how they evolve in space and time. <clears throat> this has been developed over, you know, a, roughly a hundred years. Uh, we've we've been developing this theory. Uh, the next big thing is observation, right? So we we now have this vast sensor network in, in land, air, and space. It's kind of dominated by space-based sensors these days, looking down on the earth, producing more than a terabyte of data per day. So we have, um, we have all this data and we have a model for how it should evolve, but to actually evolve it, we need compute. And that's the that's the third tier. So we need to assimilate all of this observational data to understand what is the current state of the Earth's atmosphere. And then we kind of combine that with theory to run these models into the future to predict the next, you know, the future state. And just to give you a sense of scale, um, ECMWF, which is the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting and kind of the premier weather forecasting center uh, in the world, you know, this is kind of the scale of their machine. So uh, you know, more than a million cores and, and 30 petaflops. So this is this is traditional NWP and it is hugely successful. Um, kind of amazing that it all it all works. But let's let's, let's dig into it a little more. So <clears throat> there's been really steady progress um, over the past several decades. And there's a lot going on in this figure. So maybe I can just highlight this bold uh, line here that the forecast skill has been increasing by about one day per decade. So what does that mean? It means that today's six day forecast is as accurate as the five day forecast was 10 years ago. So it's kind of like you know logarithmic progress or something like that. And it's um, it, it means it's getting harder and harder, but it also means there's there's steady progress. Um, this is from a really nice kind of review of the quiet revolution of numerical weather prediction, um, a paper in nature from uh, a few years ago. So that's the success of it. Um, the thing is, the the world is very complex, and this is this is no surprise to anybody who works in NWP. Um, in fact, this is from this figure is from that same paper. Uh, this figure is showing a lot of uh, physical processes that are not explicitly resolved in the current NWP models. So what does that mean? It means that um, you know either we cannot write down the physics for these processes. Uh, or we can, but we don't have the computational sort of resources to simulate them faithfully. Like we can't, you know, resolve them. We can't have uh, sort of cell sizes in the simulation that are small enough to resolve these processes. So instead of explicitly simulating them, we have some sort of parameterization that tries to capture like the 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 coarse grained effects of these processes. And that is a very reasonable thing to do. And that's been again a very successful approach. 
Um, but it starts to make you think like, could, could we do better with, with lots of, uh, if you had enough data for these complex processes, could you do better? One more figure on kind of the, the complexity of, you know, these, these systems. This is from this textbook, um, Numerical Weather and Climate Prediction, uh, where I it just, I, I have this book and, you know, I, I enjoy kind of reading through it and, and learning from it. And there's this one figure on uh, how water and snow and rain and ice can all sort of move between these different phases uh, in different ways. And the punchline is it's, it's really, really complex, right? So simulating this from like first principles would be very hard. And so again, this kind of begs the question, um, could a data-driven approach, a machine learning approach improve upon uh, physics-based NWP? So it's a, it's, a, it's a high bar to clear because traditional NWP is so successful. But then again, there's lots of data out there and there are these processes that um, are, are difficult or impossible for us to sort of uh, model using the physics that we know or that we think we know, right? And um, we have some, some version of, of, uh, of the truth, but it's not, uh, it's not complete, I'm sure. So this is the approach that uh, uh, this is kind of the question that I was asking, you know, a couple of years ago, and I and I set off on this project, and the design philosophy that I took for the sort of machine learning component of this, the first idea is just, hey, traditional NWP works um, really well, so let's let's try to mimic it as much as we can in the machine learning architecture, in some kind of loose sense. So, of course, we're going to be modeling these variables that drive traditional M NWP like temperature, humidity, wind, and so on. Um, this one is, I, I think, an important point. It's just, maybe it's obvious, but try to push to sort of the, the densest, uh, you know, physical grid, meaning like high, you know, fine spatial resolution, fine temporal resolution that you can, that you can afford essentially with whatever the constraints are. And this scenario, the constraints were, you know, budget and sort of GPU memory. So I was trying to push the limit of what I could fit into, um, in this case, the single A100 GPU and whatever, you know, whatever my budget would allow. Um, and then, of course, you need two other key ingredients. You need a machine learning architecture that would enable this. So I went with this graph neural network or mesh graph net approach and a data set. And when I was doing this work, you know, Era 5 had been out for a few years and it's it's this incredible data set. It's a you know, a reanalysis data set of the Earth's weather from the past, you know, I don't know how many decades now, but like maybe 50 plus years. And we'll talk more about this, but that was the data set that was that I used here. The other thing I would emphasize um, is that I kept it pretty simple. Uh, I, I, I did not use any of these kinds of approaches that are often used for when we're thinking about ML and, and physical systems and dynamics. So I did not use any conservation laws, no conservation of momentum or energy or anything like that. Uh, didn't use physics informed neural networks or symmetry environment neural networks. This is not to say that these approaches wouldn't work. It's just to say that you can have success without them. <laughs> so you can, you can, you know, build models that work, you know, pretty well uh, without those kinds of approaches. And there is something to be said for simplicity, right? So you can really sort of understand, debug, and scale up a system um, more easily if it's a simpler system. So all I really did here is I took, you know, this uh, mesh graph net approach, applied it to era five data, and did straightforward supervised learning, and that was it. Um, of course, there's like, you know, some details here and there, but that's essentially what it was. Um, I want to talk about this really interesting question of like the types of, of training data that you could have when you're thinking about weather forecasting. So um, let's let's see, there's forecast data, there's reanalysis data, and there's observation data. And I do think of them as kind of a spectrum going from on the left, we have more of like, like a physical model. It's basically solving partial differential equations. And on the right, we have more like pure observational data. And what's interesting to ask is if you trained an ML model on each of these kinds of data sets separately, what is the best case outcome? What's the best case scenario from that? And here's, here's my reasoning through this. Um, if we start on the left with forecast data, imagine you took you know, the ECMWF IFS model. So 
this is some system for solving these equations and you just ran it you know kind of synthetically for you know a million years and you generate a lot of training data and then you train a model on that and best case scenario is that the training loss goes to zero meaning you have built a perfect emulator of that specific you know system so that's you know that's cool but you <clears throat> you aren't going to outperform that system so the best case scenario is you perfectly emulate it but you don't outperform the traditional nwp engine so in my mind that's the least interesting category of training data to work with on the other end of the spectrum is imagine learning from raw observational data like you know some microwave radiance from some satellite and you know you're, you're just learning from raw data well that sounds really hard and i'll talk about that a little more later but there i believe the best case scenario is is you know you outperform traditional nwp why because you you have the potential to learn all of these dynamics and subtleties that are not being captured faithfully in traditional nwp and it seems to me like if you had enough data that that must be true in some limit if you had enough data and kind of the question is do we have enough data you know in 2023 for that to be true or not the work i'm showing you today and the work that kind of all these other uh models that i'm that have happened in the past couple of years they're all working on something in between which is reanalysis data like era 5 and this is really a blend of the two it's using observational data uh, real observational data from real sensors, but it's um, taking that data, which is sort of sparse in space and sparse in time, and it's making it like dense in space and dense in time. It's putting it onto a regular grid in space and time, and it's doing that interpolation onto a grid using physics, using a physical model. As this is how I think of it, at least. So it's taking, you know, observations and it's putting them onto a regular grid, not using, you know, cubic spline interpolation, but using like physical modeling to kind of fill in the gaps. So it's a blend. And to me, if you say, what's the best case scenario, it's it's hard to say ahead of time what the what the answer is here. Now, we've had a lot of, uh, you know, teams and models take a run at this now. And so I'd say the question mark here is more like um, you can it's it's you're getting really close, if not if not clearly exceeding traditional NWP, at least along some metrics um along some dimensions so the the best case scenario here looks quite good these days and it's and it's getting better here's the the actual ml architecture that i was uh, basing my work on so there was this paper that came out um, a few years ago from uh, a group at DeepMind, uh, learning mesh-based simulation with graph networks the you know, mesh graph net was their word for this kind of model and the main point is that hey let's simulate local dynamics on a mesh, but using a graph neural network. So there's lots of traditional partial differential equation solvers that run on meshes, but they're using PDEs to simulate the dynamics. So, hey, why don't we use this, this deep learning architecture um, to emulate those dynamics using kind of just a, a supervised learning approach. Uh, and the, the graph neural network piece, I won't have time to get into that, but essentially, right, it's, um, you can kind of think of it as a generalization of a convolutional neural network, or you can just think of it as I have a, a graph like this with nodes, and there are edges between some of those nodes. Here, they're all like local edges, and those nodes are exchanging information. They're exchanging it in a kind of differentiable, learnable, deep learning kind of way. And you can train that system to emulate dynamics. And when I saw this, it was like, wow, this is a great fit for this weather problem. Um, for many reasons, yeah, like the geometry of the sphere works well. Uh, there's there's a lot of reasons this is a good fit, and so I went with this approach. So if we look at the model for this this weather forecasting system um, that I built, this is the sort of high level abstract cartoon. You have <clears throat> some input on the top left, and this is actually just the current state of the atmosphere. So you you could use the history going back you know a few hours or a day or whatever and that's actually i'm i'm sure probably a good idea uh but i didn't i kept it very simple it's just the current state and then it goes into this model and it comes out and you get the next state and if you then take that output state and you put it in as the input you can do this again and you can do this again and again and you can roll out into the future a longer forecast 
So if the initial prediction is trying to go out six hours into the future, which is what my model was doing, then you can string together several six hour predictions to go out, you know, six days into the future, something like that. So it's this autoregressive uh, process. Here's a little more detailed look at the architecture. So again, we start with the 3D atmospheric state at some time t. The way this is actually represented is you have a big, uh, well, you have, you have uh, nodes, they start off in latitude longitude space because that's how era five is stored. And then for each one of these latitude longitude nodes, I have 78 channels of information that represent uh, you know, all these different kind of weather variables like wind, temperature, humidity at different levels in the atmosphere. And they've all just been kind of put into the channel dimension for that spatial node. And there's a little extra information like solar irradiance and uh, that kind of thing. And you encode this current state. Uh, we actually encode it into a different spatial representation, which is this icosahedron grid. <laughs> Uh, so we're no longer in lat long space. And this is kind of a latent state. And we do several rounds of processing in this latent state. This is the sort of message passing graph neural network part. And then we decode back to physical variables on a latitude longitude grid. And we get the 3D atmospheric state six hours into the future. So that's the basic setup. And again, we can then take that output and put it as the input and run this system autoregressively into the future to make longer forecasts. I wanted to talk briefly about the size of this model. Um, this model, you know, is relatively small. This is the one that, that I built for this project. The model weights are 25 megabytes. So let's think about that number in the context of other, other data sizes. One way we can think about this is comparing it to the data set, ERA-5, that this model was trained on. The punchline here is that the model weights are much, much smaller than the size of ERA-5. And so you, you would not expect any kind of overfitting. Um, and indeed, we do not see any evidence of overfitting. This is just sort of going from the full ERA-5 data set to the subset of data that I used, and then it's you know, how much information is actually in there. This is my estimate for kind of how compressible the data is, right? It's it's very smooth in space and smooth in time. And so it's highly compressible, but still it's probably something like 20 gigabytes of information. And then we're learning down to a 25 megabyte model. So thousand times different. So my takeaway here, no overfitting. And we, we don't see any overfitting in the validation or testing sets, but also like there's a lot more data available for potentially improving the quality of this model. The other point I would make, though, is that do you need it? Do you need more data? Do you need bigger models? And you know, honestly, I think yes. Like you, you actually will get a better model with more data and more uh, and a larger model. But I guess my point here is to sort of think about this a little bit because what are we trying to learn? We're trying to learn local dynamics, and local dynamics are simple, right? Like they are described by some set of partial differential equations that, you know, maybe if you couldn't put it on a t-shirt, you know, it's, it's pretty close. Uh, so we're trying to learn this really, you know, compact set of equations. And do you really need even 25 megabytes to do that? I guess maybe my, my takeaway here would be, um, it's not going to be quite as simple as something you can write on a t-shirt. You know, remember these diagrams I was showing you with snow and rain and ice and all that. So there's actually quite a lot of like subtle dynamics that you need to learn. Um, but this is different than like large language models, right? Where you need to sort of understand some huge amount of complexity from history and human thought and culture and language. This is not that. We're trying to learn sort of simple, simple-ish physical dynamics. Um, so I, I don't see this going to like ever larger and larger models. Um, or at least not at the scale of like large language models. So there's there's some room to be gained with more data, bigger models, but I don't think it will be just like endless is maybe the way to put it. Just quick details for the training data. I, I trained on 40 years of weather data, one degree resolution. So this is, this is not the full resolution of ERA-5 and the follow-up works that came after 
uh, went down to the full resolution of 0.25 degrees is about two terabytes. Like I said, no conservation laws. Um, I was doing this on a single GPU for just this is kind of in the weeds, but for people that work with these models, um, you know, these kind of rematerialization operations in like JAX or Haiku or, you know, the PyTorch equivalent, they can be really, really useful for GPU memory management. So if you don't know about those, uh, check those out. Multi-step loss. This is just saying that the model itself only steps forward six hours into the future, right? One step. But we don't want to forecast six hours into the future. We want to forecast, you know, six days into the future. We want to roll it out many times. And so we trained the model like that. We trained it, you know, going out maybe a day or two into the future, many, many steps so that the model could learn like that it was actually going to be used like that and could adjust its weights accordingly. And then it was about five days of, of wall time training. Okay, uh, here are the results. This is kind of the, the basic uh, first step is looking at how well the model can predict the six hour differences in these atmospheric variables. So this is the sort of ground truth from era five on the left. This is the machine learning model output on the right. And um, you can see we have different variables here. Let's maybe look at temperature in the middle. And so this is the change in temperature that era five has in its data set. And this is the change in temperature that the ML model predicts based on just the current state. And you know, qualitatively, what you're observing here is that there's you know, the the model has has learned to predict these six hour differences, you know, relatively accurately. Then we can roll it out into the future, and uh, this is looking at humidity going out 72 hours or three days into the future. So this is multiple steps of the model, and the model is just starting with the initial conditions here, and then all of these are like you know multiple steps out into the the future and you'll notice first that it, it does start to smooth the output relative to era 5 so that's a deficiency of this model and i'm sure there's there's work that could be done to sort of tighten that up and and produce sharper looking and more realistic looking uh, rollouts but broadly qualitatively you're seeing that you're tracking these sort of large-scale dynamics these large-scale flows of humidity um, around the globe so that was all pretty qualitative. Um, actually, this is still qualitative too. I'll go through this a little bit quickly. Um, hurricane Sandy, roughly 10 years ago, kind of a infamous hurricane in that it's one where the American forecasting system, GFS, kind of got it wrong <laughs> and the European system uh, got it right. And the, the GFS system predicted this hurricane going out into the Atlantic, whereas in fact, it, it, it made landfall kind of in the New York City area and, and did a lot of damage. And so I just was curious, like, how does this ML system do? And this is the summary. It actually does predict the same uh, hurricane sort of spinning up and going into the, the eastern seaboard of the United States. So this was, you know, kind of remarkable to me, at least. It's using these initial conditions from era five, which are, you know, which were not available at the time because they're like really good analysis conditions. But still, like, given that, you know, eight days out, this thing is able to predict where the hurricane is going to go. I'll show you the dynamics right here. So this is not to say that it's getting everything right. Like the wind speed is probably lower than reality. But I find it kind of remarkable that the ML system could, you know, create a hurricane um, and, and evolve it into the future uh, relatively accurately. One thing you can ask, uh, this is a little bit of an, of an aside, but just how numerically stable is this system? So what happens, say, if you just run it for a year into the future? Of course, we do not expect it to have any predictive power after, you know, I don't know, six, seven days, something like that. But just what happens? Um, so this is more of just a, a study I did. This is a year of rolling this thing out into the future. On the top, there's era five. On the bottom, there's the ML model. And I guess what I would just take away from this is that it 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 actually hangs together. Um, I thought it would just totally go off the rails and produce, you know, all zeros or or who knows what. Um, but it actually just keeps kind of chugging along. But it does relatively quickly become like, 
you know, obviously unphysical. So you can see everything is getting smoothed out. And there's also um, some just like artifacts, like this grid pattern emerges that's related to the, the grid we were simulating it on. So, you know, bad things do start to happen, but I, I was kind of surprised given there's no conservation of momentum, no conservation of energy, that this thing kind of just keeps chugging along and doesn't uh, doesn't totally go off the rails. So not not super practical, but just kind of an interesting property of this model. Uh, the model is really fast. This, you know, is because of two things. It's it's learned all these patterns, so it's kind of doing pattern matching, and also it's running on a GPU. So one model step takes uh, 0 0.04 seconds. So a five-day forecast takes 0.8 seconds. So this opens the door for you know running lots and lots of variations of a forecast, so an ensemble forecast with you know many more than 100 members. Which is really interesting. I mean, you can start to think about like you know long tail kind of events and and what you could characterize with that many ensemble members. So getting into more of a quantitative look, uh, this is comparing the quality of the forecast from this model shown in black with quality of forecast from GFS, the American model, and ECMWF, the European model. Uh, in green and blue. And these are how many days in the future you are forecasting, and this is the root mean squared error on some variable. And I don't want to get into this in great detail, but I guess the <laughs> main takeaway is this ML model, which again, pretty simple, straightforward approach, is getting you into the same, you know, sort of ballpark of quality as these other models. So it's it works surprisingly well. Um, you can even see for this humidity variable that it's it's surpassing in quality both of the models at sort of the the five day time scale. There are a lot of caveats to this that I uh, don't really have time to get into. Like, you know, one of them being just briefly that this model is running at one degree resolution. And so what I'm comparing to here is if you take the full resolution you know, ECMWF model, and then you coarsen it to one degrees and compare it to, you know, era five on one degrees. So there's all kinds of little subtleties like that, that, um, that are, that are valid. But I guess the, the headline is that, you know, even so it's, it's kind of, it was surprising to me how well this model worked compared to these uh, traditional models. This was when I wrote the paper. Now let's fast forward. Uh, I, I gave a similar talk a couple of months ago. So something like 18 or 20 months later, what's what does this look like now? Weatherbench 2 is an effort from Google Research to standardize the data and code for evaluating AI weather models. There's a lot going on here. So let me let me highlight these three rows. These are the three ML models that this project sort of chose as its baseline models to evaluate performance on. Um, let's see, there's there's one from Hawaii, which is this huge uh, sort of telecommunications company, uh, one of the biggest makers of uh, smartphones in the world. Um, DeepMind, of course, everyone's familiar with. Um, and then this was the work that I did. And it's, you know, just some some guy working from his kitchen table in uh, in New Mexico. So it's I'm, I'm honored to be on on here with these these other research groups. The other thing to take in here is that there's been a it was really fast progress. So the, I released my work in February of 2022. And then later that year, these results came out. And there's there's been others for sure, um, too many to include here. And I'd say these days, GraphCast from DeepMind is the state of the art um, that I'm aware of. And it's actually, it's a, it's a very similar architecture to what uh, I was showing you earlier for this work. So it's it's this graph net approach. Uh, it's it's um, you know it's at finer resolution though. It's 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 like a scaled up, much scaled up version of it, and also some cool stuff around like uh, hierarchical grids. So that's kind of the approach that's uh, seems to be working really well. And what you're looking at here is how does the performance of these models compare to um, the IFS. Uh, model from ECMWF where blue is outperforming and red is underperforming. So, you know, like you were seeing in my previous figure, like I, there are a couple of places where 
I was starting to outperform the quality of, of IFS, but now it's really looking like, hey, you know, the AI, the best AI models are consistently beating the best single NWP forecast. What I mean there is like, this is not comparison. This is not comparing to ensemble forecasts, which is actually where the strongest predictive power is. But still, um, this is remarkable. This is like going from, you know, <laughs> like really rapid progress. And suddenly these things are like outperforming the best single, you know, model in the world. Are there still caveats around resolution, around operationalizing these, et cetera? Yes, but like hard to deny there's been rapid progress here. And then for the kind of, you know, people who really are into this stuff, um, the mean of the ensemble forecast is this green curve. This is kind of the best possible way to squeeze out all the performance from the traditional NWP. And, you know, this red curve is the graph cast uh, model and it's it's right there. It's actually surpassing on the few day time scale. So they're approaching the even the mean of the ensemble in terms of performance. Also, this is becoming operational. This is remarkable. Um, this past summer, uh, MetNet, which is a different kind of forecast. This is actually more of a now cast going on the hour time scale into the future instead of the days time scale. Um, this is this is real. This is like this is a really cool uh, approach, really cool paper. If you haven't checked it out, um, and it's it's you know Google Google Weather is using it, it for things like precipitation. And then we were talking about this um, earlier before the talk started, but I've I've been really like you know impressed with how much ECM def ECMWF has been engaging with this. So they've, you know, as of September of this year, started posting the outputs of these AI models on their page, you know, kind of side by side with like the traditional models. So you can really see like, what's the comparison? How well are these models doing in more of an operational um, setup? Uh, this was a hurricane that came, you know, in September, and the punchline here was that they, the, the AI models did quite well for this, and this is clearly like out of distribution. This is not, or out of training data, right? This is this is a new, um, unobserved uh, data set, and they're doing well forecasting on that. I'd say one more thing here, actually, was that ECMWF has also um, started working on their own AI models. So there was a blog post about a month ago showing how they're kind of taking this same graph net approach um, to develop models. And I think this is really this is really good and kind of remarkable. It's like it's been, you know, researchers like me or, you know, tech companies that have big research groups that are building these things. Well, now um, ECMWF, which has been working on ML for, with weather for, you know, many, many years, but they're, they're kind of embracing this end to end ML approach and or at least exploring it. And I think that's important because in my mind, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, the, the best future version of this is one where you're using something closer to raw observational data rather than reanalysis or analysis data. And, you know, centers like ECMWF or, you know, NOAA in the US are in the best place to, to work with that huge amount of, of messy observational data. So, whether they take the lead on it or they enable others to, I think it's really good that they're engaging with this new wave of kind of AI weather. So what's next for these AI weather models? Um, I think it's clear we're gonna have more operational AI weather. Like this is this is not, I don't think this is going away. And then I actually just, just said this, but in my opinion, if you think about the research frontier here, like what is what is interesting, what is potentially powerful? And to me, it's trying to learn directly from the sparse, messy observational data rather than learning from the gridded, clean reanalysis data. So this graphic on the right is showing you, you know, some representative example of a, a satellite, you know, recording some data looking down on the Earth. And you can see it's got missing data all over the place. Um, this is not, this is not the kind of clean, you know, gridded data that you know people are often used to working with. So, working with this kind of data, which comes in lots of different flavors, right? There's there's all kinds of different types of sensors observing Earth. Um, it's going to be challenging, but to me, this is where the the greatest potential is for outperforming known physics because that's you know once you start 
you know, using a physical model to get it onto a reanalysis grid, you're introducing like a pretty strong prior on what you think the physics is. Um, so if you wanted to go to the most extreme version of this, you remove that prior and you just say, I have lots of observational data and I'm going to learn how to map from observational data to basically observational data in the future. And that approach seems like it has the highest potential. Um, but we'll see. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the prior imposed by the physical models that we have today is just the right amount of prior. Maybe that's the sweet spot. And, and that's, that's where the highest performance is. This is my last slide. So my takeaways here are uh, traditional numeric weather prediction is an incredible scientific and technical achievement. Um, I think this is really underappreciated, so I like to emphasize it. Uh, I think this group is probably pretty familiar with the idea of modeling physical systems with ML approaches and, and you know, deep learning can be used to model these systems. Here, I've given you one example of uh, one where a pretty straightforward approach can work well. And then for this specific application of AI weather forecasting, it's moving really fast. It's outperforming the best single traditional forecast. And you know, I think it's 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 really exciting to think about how far uh, can this go. Thanks for the chance to talk today. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Does anyone online have any questions? Yeah. Oh, I was wondering if you know of any work that's been trying. So in the reanalysis, uh, there's still underlying it is still the traditional numerical weather prediction model. If there has been any effort on, on replacing that by the AI model itself, Yes, yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's an interesting question that goes to this <clears throat> this kind of heart of of what I was thinking about here. Maybe what I'll do is I'll step back and and show you this model right here on the left. <clears throat> so Metnet <clears throat> is is a model that has actually done what I was proposing, uh, but it's done it for now casting. So here it's not learning from reanalysis data. So it's sort of broken free of, you know, that constraint of having a traditional NWP engine for, for kind of reanalysis, re right? It's not doing that. It's learning from observational data directly and, and data that's sparse in space and sparse in time. So the mental picture there is right, like little little dots of weather stations. Um, that have data and it's they've come up with this really nice approach for figuring out how to make predictions everywhere, even where there's not um, stations. So this is an example, I think, of one where um, we can actually learn directly from the data and, and sidestep or bypass uh, the NWP engine that's used for making the reanalysis data sets. So something like this, but on the global scale for the, the medium range, like several days forecasting, um, would be really interesting. Okay. Uh, Sam's asked a question in the chat uh, about like physics in both directions. All right. Um, so Sam in the chat asked, you mentioned you didn't integrate physical constraints, e.g. physics and form neural networks in the model, mainly for simplicity and ensuring you could scale the model up. What are your thoughts on where the field of SIML will go when these models mature and get even more complex? And then the second part is, do you think we should embrace more domain agnostic methods to improve our model, or should we look to put the physics back into the model? Mm. Yeah, um, so it's an it's an open question. It's It's like, you know, earlier when I was talking about these three different types of um of weather data to learn from go back to that here it's ways back so if you imagine a scenario where we had you know a million years of observational data with the kind of you know sensor network that we have today 
then my strong bias is that the the best possible performance would come from a um, essentially no physical prior, no domain knowledge approach that would just leverage that huge body of observational data. This is kind of the, you know, <laughs> like uh, this is a loose comparison, but like, you know, AlphaGo could learn uh, how to play Go very well from lots and lots of data and could sort of break free from what people, humans thought were uh, were good moves, right? And sort of, we 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 know something, we, but we don't have the full picture. And so if you have enough data, then you have the potential for learning the full picture, right? So that's my bias is that with enough data, um, that has to be the answer. It's kind of this like the, the better lesson, if you're familiar with that essay from uh, Richard Sutton, it's just like lots of data, lots of data, sort of simple scalable ML systems. That's that's what ends up working better in the long run than sort of handcrafted domain specific approaches. The question is, we don't have a million years of observational data. We have, you know, 50 years of observational data. Um, and so what's what's the right amount of physical prior today, right? What, what amount of physical prior um, and domain sort of knowledge gives you the best possible performance? Because um, if you look at it the other way, if you had one, one year or one day of observational data, clearly that's not going to be enough to train the system. So you need to impose a lot. You need to bring a lot of physical prior to that to get the best performance. But we're somewhere in between, right? We have decades of this data. So my my personal you know bias, my sort of hypothesis is that we're we're much closer to the we have lots of data to learn from, and that's the approach we should take, and we should strip away um, as much. We, we should certainly explore stripping away as much physical prior as possible to see what what the results look like. All right. Uh, any final questions? And um, I had a question um, regarding like well, it seems you've shown that graph neural networks seem to perform very well, but do you have an intuition into what other methods could perform very well as well, or any potential, like, say for instance, diffusion models, what's your take? Do you think they are going to work any, any good or? Yeah, yeah, uh, good good question. I think on graph neural networks, I think my my intuition is that a lot of the power is, is coming from the fact that these systems have um, some sense of locality, you know, like spatial connectedness built into the model, right? So like you have a node in, in, in Leeds and it's connected to a, a node in London, right? Like there's a spatial connectivity there. It's not connected to a node in, in Santa Fe. So this, this prior, it's a very minimal prior of like physics is mostly local. Um, that is at some level baked into the architecture of, of a graph neural network, at least one that has you know, th that kind of mesh. So that's intuition for why it works well. Um, you could contrast that with more of an attention-based uh, model that could say, "Hey, let's let's attend to, you know, the whole Earth, the whole surface of the globe at once." And what's nice about that is it's a very simple, like, in its own way, it's a very simple model, right? It's like every node on Earth could attend to every other node on Earth, and you just model the system that way, more of a, you know, attention-based kind of like transformer-like approach. And actually some of the models um, have taken that architecture, have taken that approach. And it's worked well, um, I think not as well as the, the graph net, but these are, they're, they're close. I mean, they're, the, none of these are just like clearly the best approach. And then you mentioned diffusion models. Um, I think that is interesting for <clears throat> thinking about um, how, do you, how do you sample? and how do you generate realistic ensemble members for the future? So you can imagine sort of encoding the current state of the world. And then instead of like running that forward, just as I've shown here, deterministically, you would sample from the futures um, and you would do that maybe using a diffusion model. Um, maybe it's operating on the latent state instead of the, the full resolution you know, state. Um, so I think there's potential there and yeah those are kind of some some quick thoughts yeah okay thanks
All right, if there's no more questions, I'll say another thank you to Ryan and we'll wrap it up there. So yeah, thank you very much. All right, thanks for having me.